Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip is with Marty Stewart. Marty talks about meeting the great Johnny Cash, going on the road with Johnny, and just what an experience that was. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, Marty Stewart. So, um, Johnny Cash, how did, how did, how did that happen? How did I get the job with Johnny Cash? Mm -hmm. How did you meet him? How did you... Lester Flat? I stayed with Lester and his band from 1972 to 79 when he passed away. And all of a sudden, I found myself needing a job. And uh, I looked around the world of bluegrass, and Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys were full. The Osborne Brothers were full. Jimmy Martin and the Sunny Mountain Boys were full. Uh, Ralph Stanley and the Clinch Mountain Boys uh, were full. So. I needed a gig. I actually talked to Lonnie Mack, went to upstate New York, talked to him, and that didn't quite feel right. Uh, I was thinking about actually in this very building, I uh, hung up with Bob Dylan one night, I was thinking of going to California, jumping on there. But in the meantime, I walked in and I played some with Doc and Merle Watson that summer and Vassar Clemens. And I needed a gig because that was just a summer stop. And um, I ran, walked into the Old Time Pickin' Parlor on 2nd Avenue. Randy Wood had a place. And there was a guitar a luthier named Danny Farrington building a black guitar that had a gold eagle down here. And it was really snazzy. And I went, who's that for? Is it Johnny Cash? I went, ah. So I said, do you mind if I go with you when you deliver? I'd, I'd like to meet him. He's one of my old time heroes. He said, sure. So I kept up with the progress of the guitar. And the day came, and Danny called and said, I'm going to deliver it to Cowboy Jack's studio this afternoon. Meet me there. And so met Farrington there, and we walked into Cowboy's studio, knocked on the, the door of Cowboy's office, opened the door, and it was like you know a Cheech and Chong movie. And the scene was Cowboy was dancing with a martini glass on his head. <laughs> <laughs> and this big smoke screen, and John R. Cash was sitting over there singing the Wabash Cannonball. <laughs> Hello, I'm in. Mm. And what I didn't know when that happened is two of my lifetime friends, you know, was in one room mm -hmm. waiting. And so I was introduced to the Cowboy, and I was introduced to John. And John stood up. He just he shook my hand. He just kept shaking my hand. He says. Where are you from, son? I went to Mississippi. He went, I thought so. He said, where you been? I said, getting ready. He said, I thought so. And we spent the afternoon together and wound up getting in Cowboy's car and going out on, to uh, Johnny Cash's farm or, or his uh, cabin that night, just looking around. And about a month later, I think it was, I got a call one day. I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa finishing my last show with Doc Watson. Went back to the hotel after the first show. Red light on the phone was blinking. It was my mom. She said, Bob Wooten, Johnny Cash's band member, is looking for you. And I called him. He said, John wants to know if you want to go to work with us. I said, it's a good idea. I said, when are you thinking about it? He said, tomorrow. And I said, keep talking. He, I said, he said, where are you? I went, Cedar Rapids. He said, I said, where are you? He said, we'll be in Des Moines. It was a two-hour rental car ride, and I walked in the hotel, and Bob Wooten met me, shook my hand, and welcomed me. He said, we were leaving here in you know, an hour and a half or whatever. And he said, have you some lunch, and we'll get your room ready and show up. So I walked into the cafe, and the maitre d' came over after I'd sat down. He said, Mr. Cash is on the phone for you. So I went over and John says, hey, son, glad you're here. I went, glad to be here. He said, you got anything black to wear? I went, probably. And he said, do you know all my songs? I went, you still sing them in the same key? He said, probably. And I said, then I'll probably know them. He says, well, I'm probably going to take a nap, and I'll probably see you later. Click. <laughs> <laughs> and so. And what year is this? 79. And I got on the, the was bus. Was Mar Marshall still? Marshall was not there. He had just left. He had just left. And it um, seemed like Joe Allen might have been playing bass at that time, I think. And, uh, or Henry Strelecki, I think, actually was playing oh, bass yeah? at the very beginning yeah. for a minute. And I was shown to my mark on the stage, and he walked out and went, Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. And I heard Ring of Fire start. 
And again, I hung my head. I went, whew, took me back to being nine years old watching him at the Coliseum in Jackson, Mississippi, going, this is what I want to do in my life. And that had to have been it leveled me. Oh, man, it was like going from here to here in you know, one step. And Lester was a, you know, a beloved you know, national touring act. Um, but John was, you know, I remember one time we were going across the border in Budapest. And the guards knew him. And it was kind of fun, but they said, you can't cross until you sing us a song. And so John got his guitar out and sang a song going across the border in Budapest. And I thought, this guy's serious. I'm out on the world stage now. And it was from, you know, and then it became like, again, the Foggy Mountain Boys thing and, you know, and Bird World. It's like the old line in the Eagle song, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. I never left, you know, made records and, and had some success, did a whole lot of things. But when he still, when the phone rang and he needed a guitar player, he was still the chief to the day he died. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in contact with him? We though? were next door neighbors. Out in Hendersonville, Roy Orbison's house was here, our house was here, and then John and June lived there. And I saw him four days before he died. And you took the last picture, right? Yeah. Well. I miss him every day. I miss his twisted sense of humor more than anything. He had a dark sense of humor. I loved it. I was lucky enough to hang up when Billy was producing an album on him in 84, I think it was, 83, 84. Is that the Baron? Yeah, he did that one. That was at Columbia, though. This one was um, over at 1111 Studio. Oh. And um, that's when he was doing the, that period of time when he was doing the uh, Ray Charles Friends album. Mm -hmm. But I just remember he walked in the room. Of course, I remember him. You know, when I think of him, I was turning into the alley behind Columbia one afternoon, a shank of the evening, and the sun was going down. And Johnny was, he looked kind of haggard, you know what I mean, was during that time. And he turned and he looked over his back, his shoulder at me, you know, and I just, I've, that's just, if I had a camera, like, you know, that's, that's the picture I see in my mind all the time. But I don't care, well, you know, you felt his presence when he walked. I don't care, give me your best shot. Give me your best rock star, give me your best president, give me your best whatever you got. And then bring him in the room and see what happens. Well, when... I was going to say when he he sucked the air out of the room. Absolutely. I mean, when he walked in, you could you could you know you could feel it. You, know, you could tell it. It was weird, and he did cut one of my songs. But unfortunately, did he? Yeah, which one? It, well, it never made the friggin' album. I got a copy of it, but um, it was it was a kind of a novelty thing. It was mm -hmm. called uh, "I Know You Love Me," and uh, I wrote it from watching Pepe Le Pew mm -hmm. cartoons because they didn't really love him, you know. And um, he, and it was. I was going for the boy named Slew kind of thing, you know, just to, because he was funny. He could do anything. Yeah. But some, for whatever reason, it didn't make the album. But I got it. Talking about sucking the air out of the room and his dark sense of humor. I had breakfast with him one morning, and he could make, you know, whether it was peeling an apple or lighting a cigarette or, you know, whatever he did, he just, just, just by being him, it looked so cool. One morning, you know, he, he lit a cigarette. And he was he and it went from here all the way down to the butt in one drag. <laughs> when he blew the smoke out, he said, "I quit smoking three days ago." Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Do you remember Larry Lee? Absolutely. L we, Larry used to tell me we'd sit in the lobby at CBS and he'd tell me stories with Johnny. And did you know that? Do you remember the little when he had the little monkey? Spider monkey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Larry told me the. Gave him a pill and monkey finally just probably so you know and that was in the early 60s when they were completely nuts but uh, they had john started a tax shelter record called spider monkey records in honor of the and i believe they recorded a song on gordon terry who was a, a cool fiddle player and a guy that was working on the road with him and don helms hank's old steel player rewrote the battle of new orleans and it was, he called it the Bottle of New Orleans. In 1950, where we took a little nip mm -hmm. along with Mr. Williams on the way to Mississippi, packed eight deep in a Packard limousine, uh, going to play for Oscar Davis in the town of New Orleans. 
it was the f one of the greatest parodies you've ever heard. So they did this on Gordon on the A side on Spider Monkey Records, and they couldn't figure out what to do on the B side. So, so they just tuned for about two minutes, and the song was called Tune It Up. <laughs> <laughs> Probably pretty good. Yeah, too. That's six cents of humor again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, speaking of musicians, what's what was there? Who did you did you have somebody that? You oh yeah. First and foremost, Luther Perkins. When I was plugging in my first Fender guitar and and learning my way, uh, looking my way across the the you know the landscape of country music bands, I couldn't tell you what Magellan did or what you know. Uh, a lot about American history at that point, but I could tell you what kind of costumes the bands wore, who played what brand guitar, what the drummer played, what their hair looked like, and just I knew everything about any country band, you know, that was going on in this town starting about 1967. And Luther Perkins was still, and to this day is still, I think, one of the most brilliant guitar players. You think you can do it, really? Mm -hmm. Pick it up and show me how to do it right. He, it can't. He, he was a one in a lifetime guy. I love Roy Nichols playing Merle's uh, t player. The other ultimate musician in my life was Ralph Mooney on the steel guitar. And I loved Tommy Jackson and Vassar Clements fiddle playing when I was first starting. I knew who they were. I knew that Vassar played real lonesome, real bluesy, which suited my Mississippi soul. Uh, I loved the feel that Junior Husky played. It felt like a cushion coming out of that Studio B thing. Pig Robbins mm -hmm. was like one of my, and still to this day is, you know, one of my all-time musical heroes. Uh, then you get into bluegrass guys, uh, you know, I knew all those bands. But what I loved the most about, and I heard Mooney say one time about, he said, yeah, he sang for me one time. <laughs> <laughs> he was the star, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was a lot of truth in that because those musicians, the A-team of Nashville and those Nashville musicians, part of their brilliance in my mind was they could take any singer and create a sonic identity around them. Mm -hmm. And beyond that is that every time Lloyd Green came on the radio, I knew, or on my record player, I knew it was Lloyd Green from his tone. Right. I knew it was Hal Rugg. I knew it was Weldon. Right. I knew it was Don Helms and on and on, and the same with guitar players. I knew Grady's playing. Mm -hmm. I knew that Pete Wade was close, but he, Grady had little nuances that were different. I knew the difference in Bob Moore and Junior Huskies playing, and I'm 12 years old talking this stuff, but I'd studied that stuff. And um, that was one of the beauties of the Nashville Cat thing to me. I loved the California players, the Wrecking Crew. I'd listen to those records. But those Nashville cats, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be uh, in, in that circle. And to this day, they're still the cats. They're still the cats. And, um, but the thing that I love most about those guys is their tone and their looks were their autographs. Mm -hmm. It was just as identifiable to me as Merle Haggard singing or Tammy Wynette singing or George Jones is singing. Those guys behind them. Charlie McCoy, you know, I, I never knew where he was going to turn up. Mm -hmm. And when I found out he was the guy that did the tuning on Detroit City while Jerry Reed sat there and did it, held the guitar in his lap, I went, that's awesome. That's, that is such a defining thing in my life. And the Nashville guys were just beyond compare in my mind. Yeah, Billy Sherrill said one time, he said, um, I, he said, I never like to stick my head in anybody else's sessions, you know, but one day I was at Columbia and I kind of happened to open the door and Charlie McCoy's in there playing his keys, <laughs> his, his car keys, you know, mm -hmm. on a song. You know, I mean, he could play anything, <laughs> literally. I liked it because it, it, was, it was a time capsule in the sense that those guys were mostly Southern boys, mm -hmm. cool guys, world-class country boys in some cases. Uh, but when you listen Come on, man, listen to some of those Tammy Wynette records or those early Charlie Pride records, that first stretch of Charlie Pride mm. records. Play me any records that are any better and more elegant than that. And Billy Sherrill, again, you know, as it comes to mind, is just one of those masters. Cowboy Jack Clement, that point in time, oh, you know, it just, it captured my heart. 
And to this day, I still return to those records when I need, when I lose my way and want to get started again. They still take me right back. And what it really causes me to do is re-fall in love with music. Right. There is, you know, there is that sound in the Quonset hut, that, that, that bass sound. And B. It's, B. Yeah. And it's, it's that big old cushion. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, Studio B, as you know. Now, we're it, talking RCA? RCA B. Okay. That's the first place I ever got to play in Nashville uh, with Lester Flat. But years went by, and it had kind of become, you know, a classroom, basically, right? And mm -hmm. a tourist stop for the Hall of Fame. But I'd go in there, and I would go, boy, if the right band and the right song, and let's study this room out and figure out how to do it in here and take people who loved what came from here. So we did this record called The Superlatives called Ghost Train, the Studio B Sessions. And one mm -hmm. day I was in the middle of that room and I thought, Connie's voice, Connie Smith's voice in the middle of this. I gotta hear it, I gotta hear it. So we wrote this song called I Run To You. And Connie used to tell me that she loved that studio because she knew where to aim her voice to get it to come back. Mm -hmm. And when they built the big pig, she said, I couldn't do anything with that room. She said, I, I, I just couldn't. But Studio B was like home to her. And we gathered around Connie and we made a record and it was like, it reminded me how precious that studio is. It's kind of like Sun and, you know, uh, Hitsville up north. It's, you could never plan that. Mm -hmm. People b spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on studios, but you don't get that kind of sound. Well, I, you know, I, was, I just put up a Bob Moore interview I did in 2004, just last week. And he talks about when they went into the Quonset hut, of course, the early stuff they did in the basement of the house, you know, mm -hmm. that was incredible. But when they built the Quonset, he said, my, he said, there's not a, a, a square foot in that Quonset hut that, I, that when we were doing it, setting it up. And they used burlap. I mean, you know, that was the kind of high tech stuff in the ceilings to, to catch the acoustics and everything. He said, but my base peg went on every square foot in there until we found the sweet spots, you know, and that's where they stayed, you know. And that is still relevant today. When I first started playing around Cowboy Jack Clements' uh, studio, the first thing he did is went to the he went like this, went to the filing cabinet and had, handed me a list of Cowboy's rules: never speak while the cowboy is speaking, <laughs> uh, uh, always be on time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, never mention headphones or the like. Mm -hmm. Those kind of rules that Cowboy had, but. At the time, it was absurd because everybody was living in headphones, and which we do, but when you learn to play the room and bring it down where you can play live and hear the vocalist, it's called dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I hear uh, on those old records, but it's still relevant today. We got to play in Way Too Loud, and I took the band to a church and we played where we had to pay attention. And then we started talking about dynamics, nuances, vocals, blend, all those things that come with, you know, starting a band, if it's a real band. And one night we had played the Grand Ole Opry and we played really loud and I heard it back and it sounded about that big on the speaker. But then Hank Snow and the Rainbow Ranch Boys played and they, you could basically talk like this while they were playing and it sounded this big on the mm -hmm. speaker. I went, oh, got it. Way off course here, let me go back. But we work really hard when we make records and that old TV show to put the mic in the right place, use the right mics, use instruments with real tone in them and not just something somebody gives you, you know, put on to promote if it's not what you really love. But there's a strict set of standards that we really, and it's a lifetime, again, a life sentence, chasing tone. Mm -hmm. But when you find my advice to any young musician, when you find that guitar, or mandolin, or bass, or banjo, whatever your instrument of choice is. When you find it, and you know you got it, lock it in, stay with it. It worked for Willie Nelson, it worked for Bill Monroe, it worked for Maybell Carter, it worked for Earl Scruggs, it worked for Vassar Clements. Uh, you know, they, that's, again, back to that tone. That's their signature, and it becomes well, a life partner. You know, the, it's, it's so wild to think about. You know, they used to start out with one, two, three tracks from those greatest records, and. And the way the engineer would mix the session was move them closer or further away from the microphone. I mean, that's... 
that was it. We did some sessions at uh, Capitol in Hollywood, and the great engineer Al Schmidt was right across the hall working on a Bob Dylan record, I think. And Al came over and listened to some things we were doing, and it was an instrumental record that we'd been working on. And he gave his thumbs up, and Mick Connolly, our engineer, was like, that's Al, you know. But Al is another one of those guys, his version of EQ is move the mic and find it, like mm -hmm. Bob Moore's talking about. And there's a lot to that. There's a, it takes more time. You have to slow down. For about 20 years, we've missed on Harry Stinson's drum, sound, drum sounds, in my opinion. But we finally got it right because we slowed down and brought three sets of drums and let, let the song dictate what we need. You know, back to Connie, that voice, it's never wavered. It's never wavered. And when you have something like that, that you know that it's a sound that you can count on, you can work around that. You can build around it. It becomes architecture then, and I love that. Hey, we're going to take one more break. We'll be right back. Can we sit down for a pizza? Yeah. <laughs>